Youngstown is the most famous separation of powers case. It considers the specific question of the president's ability to take action that's not expressly authorized by a statute. Justice Jackson's concurrence in Youngstown has proven to be the most influential and most cited part of the opinion. This video situates his approach to the question within our larger separation of powers framework. In Youngstown, President Truman ordered the Secretary of Commerce to take control of steel manufacturing plants. The President thought that an adequate supply of steel was a matter of national security during the Korean War, and that impending labor strikes might lead to shortages of necessary military equipment. As it happens, there were actually some statutes expressly allowing the President to take similar action in some analogous circumstances, but those statutes weren't entirely on point. And in fact, the president did not rely on those statutes. When the case got to court, the president argued that the Constitution does not limit presidents to take only those actions that have been authorized in advance by Congress. The Constitution doesn't actually say very much about the presidency. Article 2 contains a very short list of specific powers and duties, but these don't come close to encompassing everything that presidents do in practice. Instead, presidential actions tend to be linked to some far more general language. The president is vested with the executive power, whatever that is. The president takes an oath to faithfully execute the office of the president. And this includes making sure that the president takes care that the laws be faithfully executed. And that's it. Overall, the lack of detail in Article 2 leaves open a lot of questions. A starting point for answering them would be to find out if any powers are exclusively assigned to only one branch of the government. For example, under Article 1, each House of Congress may determine its own rules of procedure. Elsewhere, Article 1 says Congress has the sole power of impeachment. Meanwhile, the President has the exclusive ability to grant pardons and the exclusive ability to issue military orders as Commander-in-Chief. So if the President acts in an area where Congress has exclusive decision-making authority, Congress will obviously win. Similarly, if Congress acts in an area where the president has exclusive authority, the president obviously wins. But in many cases, the constitutional allocation of authority is either concurrent or otherwise unclear. For example, the president is commander-in-chief, but Congress has power to make rules to govern the military. The boundaries between those two concepts could be fuzzy in particular cases, and this is only one example. So what we really need is some additional guidance in this middle area. Justice Jackson's influential idea from his Youngstown concurrence is to divide this middle area into three separate zones. Judicial decision-making in each zone can emphasize slightly different considerations. Before looking at the zones, however, it's worth noting what stays the same. Namely, these top and bottom rows. If a case involves powers that are exclusively legislative or exclusively executive, it's easy to tell who should win. Outside of these areas of exclusive power, Justice Jackson proposes three zones. These are defined by the interaction of two factors, what Congress has legislated and what the President has done. In Zone 1, the President has acted consistently with statutes. In Zone 3, the President has acted contrary to a statute. And in Zone 2, there is no statute. Congress is silent. In Justice Jackson's opinion, Zone 1 exists mostly for sake of completeness. And in fact, if a case arises in Zone 1, there really won't be a separation of powers problem. The President's action might be unconstitutional for some reason, but the reason will not be separation of powers. Let's now think about Zone 3. Who should win in this situation? Pause the video for a moment to think about an answer. In Zone 3, Justice Jackson said Congress should win. 
either all the time or virtually all the time. The president may not act contrary to statute. Let's take a moment to figure out why. As a textual matter, Congress has some important powers that can be and are used to direct the activities of the executive branch. These include the spending power and the necessary and proper clause. So Congress has grounds to issue some instructions to presidents. Now what is the president supposed to do when Congress speaks? The president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So acting contrary to a statute is really not a faithful execution of Congress's laws. Returning to our chart, what happens in Zone 2? Here, the president is not acting contrary to a statute because there is no statute. Justice Jackson used the evocative phrase zone of twilight to describe this area. He recognized that when Congress is silent, as a practical matter, there might be strong incentive for a president to take independent action. This is especially true if the country is in unforeseen circumstances. The other opinions in Youngstown took different positions on this question. Some said the president could not act at all. Others said the president should be presumed able to act. For Justice Jackson, there's no rule of thumb for a court to use in Zone 2. This is an area for case-by-case -case decision making in light of the imperatives of events and contemporary imponderables. For Justice Jackson, abstract theories of law will be of little use in trying to predict the outcomes. Overall, Justice Jackson's approach leaves a lot of questions unanswered, but it helps provide a framework that guides us to ask a lot of the right questions. First, we should determine if a separation of powers problem really exists, and if it does, we should think about whether the powers are exclusively assigned to the legislature or exclusively assigned to the executive. If either of those is true, the case will be close to over. If we are in this area where authority is either concurrent or unclear, and that's going to be most of the time for the hard cases, we should determine if the case properly falls within Zone 2 or Zone 3. That decision will depend on the action taken by Congress and the wording of any relevant statutes. Once we know which zone we're in, we know a little more about what to do. If we're in Zone 3, the President should faithfully execute Congress's laws and not contravene them. If we're in Zone 2, we've got some more thinking to do. We have to consider the totality of the circumstances and use our best judgment. And in cases like that, the tools set out in the Kickstarter are likely to be useful.